so many blessings to us. We thank you for that. And the greatest blessing of all, your son, Jesus Christ, uh, came to this earth and lived and died and was crucified on that cross for us. That whole purpose that we might have eternal life with you in heaven someday. And we pray for that. Lord, we lift up to you the events of our congregation and uh, all those things that we endeavor to do to um, have fellowship and to uh, show Christianity and love towards others. And, uh, we pray, Lord, that you bless all those activities and bless us each day that our heart would be uh, in the right place for reaching out to others that we would have the courage and strength to do that and, and be willing to give of ourselves and our means that you would bless us with to grow your kingdom. Lord, we pray for those that we have mentioned today on the prayer list and we pray that your hand would be upon them. We pray for Ashley uh, as she's recovering. We pray that you would be with her and her family. We pray for uh, Debbie and Pat Hoffmaster pray for Laura Franks and her family. Pray for uh, Alan Rupert, Dana and Kara Hedlund and their family. For all those in Afghanistan, the, the missionaries in Afghanistan, and, uh, the Americans and our allies for that whole situation. We pray that your hand will be upon it. Pray for Haiti, for all those that are suffering there, for the governments and for Christians and for uh, the poor and the hungry. Lord, we pray for all of our kids and uh, those that are teaching uh, this year going back to school. Uh, we pray that your hand will be upon them and guide them through that. We pray that uh, Christianity would prevail in all these situations, that their love that your care and that your blessings would be used in the right way, uh, that it would make an impression upon those uh, in this world. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can be here to worship you, that we can be here together fellowshipping with one another. We pray that you would give us strength to go throughout this week uh, to do the things that you would have us do, Lord. In your son's name we pray. Amen. books will be number 134. Oh, uh -huh. 
Say 
Thank you, Lord, for this day. Just thank you for the wonderful opportunity we have to come here today and to worship you, Lord. Please just help us now as we continue to worship, Lord. Please just let us clear our minds and uh, stay focused on you, Lord. Please just be with us as we get ready to communion with one another, Lord. Please just let us uh, remember uh, the meaning of that, Lord. It's not just a cracker and some juice, Lord. It's, it's your son's body and blood, Lord. Just thank you for that. Thank you for letting him come be down here and to die and to rise again, Lord. So we have hope to be with you forever, Lord. Please just be with us all. Please be with everyone that's struggling and be with uh, the sick and just everything that's bad going on in the world, Lord. Please just let everybody uh, look to you and realize that uh, there is hope, Lord. Just thank you for everything. Since I pray. Amen. <laughs> Number three fifty. <clears throat> At this song, we'll be taking the Lord's song. <clears throat> when my love to Christ goes weak, when for deeper faith I see. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. 
Lord, we thank you so much for your son's blood that was shed on our behalf. Although he was sinless, he took on our sins. He hung and died on that cross for us. And that blood that was shed washes away those sins so that we can be clean in your sight. We thank you so very much for that. Pray that you will help us to focus our minds on, on him at this time as we partake of the fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song of encouragement is going to be at page 927. 927. Now let's go ahead and turn to number six, 763. 763 again if you're following in song. After uh, this song, we'll have Luke will be having our scripture reading. Isn't that something at 68 years old? 
He didn't think he had to go to church. In fact, he was a big, big, big man, and it took six guys to drag him into the building. His wife went to church, but he didn't. His kids went to church, he didn't. He didn't think you need the church. He said, I can be saved without the church. And I don't care about those mansions up there. I don't care about the stars and the crowns. That doesn't mean anything to me. I just want to be there. But I don't have to go to church. Well, he finally did, as a lot of fellows do, the day of his funeral. So I want us to think about what the Bible says about the church and the place of the church in the Christian life. And I understand that most American people don't feel that the church is essential. What concerns me is I think that there are a great number of people that are in the church where they no longer believe that the church is essential to their Christian relationship with God. Amen? And, and uh, as a matter of fact, when you start to look at research, what they're finding out after a year of COVID-19, only one-third of the people who used to attend church now attend. And uh, it's, it's my conjecture. I mean, I'm surmising that uh, a lot of folks will just never come back to church. And one of the reasons I think that is because we're creatures of habit. You remember that in Luke chapter 4, it was Jesus' custom or habit to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. In other words, it was his habit. If you were looking for Jesus on the Sabbath day, you would find him somewhere in the assembly. That's what the synagogue meant. I think that there's a real danger here because it's likely that there will be some who will never, ever, never, ever, never come back. And it is of my judgment that you cannot be saved without the church. I understand that the church doesn't save you. Jesus does. But the church is in God's plan. It was His plan. It was His idea. And God thought that we needed the church after all. He gave Himself for it. He died for it. He loved the church. And in that same passage of Ephesians 5, in verse 23 through 25, He will save the church, which is His body. What I'm suggesting to you is that the Bible has no idea whatsoever of a solitude Christian. Well, I've been thinking about starting my own church. Well, Bailey, you can't do that. Well, why can't I? All I'm going to do is have me and my Bible with no people. Well, you can't do that. Why not? Because the church is God's people. It never was some person out in the mountain by himself. Why the church? Uh, you know what? We're still having problems with the church. We still think that we go to church. What the Bible says is that the church gathers on the first day of the week. It isn't that you go to the church even after 2,000 years. We still think that we go to a place, we go to a building, we go to a location that we go to church. It is the church that gathers. Oh, it's, it's not that we, oh, you understand what I'm trying to say. We are the church. The church gathers together. And so the question comes, why does the church gather? Now, I want to make sure I made that clear. It is the church that gathers to a certain place. You do not go to church. The church gathers together. Did you all see what I just said? The church is what? Gathers. It's not that you gather to the church. It's the church that gathers. Boy, I think I got it. 
it's really rather stunning here, you know, when you start to think of all the Bible study and all the learning and all the material that we have gathered together over so many millenniums now, that we still have the wrong idea about what the church is. And uh, I was thinking, you know, even the Greek word for church, it never refers to the church. How about that? The word in the Greek for church is kirkion, and that's never used to refer to the church. For instance, in Revelation chapter 1, you remember that John is on the island of Patmos, and uh, it's the Lord's day. That's the only place where the word for, in the Greek for church is used. And it means it's the Lord's day, the day, the Lord's day. It's, it's His day. It belongs to Him. But He's not talking about the church as we understand it. Uh, it did that make sense? The word that's always used for church, which we translated out of the Greek into church, is the Greek word ekklesia, but not the Greek word kirkion. And that I rather amazing to you that the word church never refers to church in the New Testament. That the word for the word that is translated church in your English Bible ecclesia refers to a called out assembly. It's an assembly that has been summoned out of the world. Not that we go into a monastery, but we come out of the world system. We're no longer part of the world the way the world values and how they think and the philosophy of the world. We've come out of that kind of place. And we have come together as a people which is called the ecclesia, the assembly of God. But we're not going to change it now, are we? I mean, for us to say the assembly of Christ, that would probably throw a, a, us into some kind of turmoil. Just, just go like this if you're still listening. So you've got to understand if you were actually translating out of the Greek, the word the ecclesia, which is used all the time in reference to the church in the ancient Bible, referred to the assembly. And the, the, it is the church that gathered together. In other words, you are the church, and on the first day of the week you gather together as the church. And so when you come together in this assembly, as you gather together, then you have to ask, what does the church do when it gathers together? And that's what we want to address for just a moment. In Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse number 42, you'll remember on that great day of Pentecost, when the gospel was preached, and those that responded to the gospel, that is, those that believed that Jesus was the Christ. And they understood that they had killed him. They were pricked in their hearts, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what must we do? And he told them, You must repent, and you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. And then the Bible says they persuaded them with many other words, and the Lord added to the ecclesia or to those who were being saved. Those people who were saved, the people of God, the redeemed people, became the church. And now we see in verse 42, the church gathered. Now if you think about this, and I mentioned it in the Bible class, the devil's big mistake was when he persecuted the church, but not to get into that because you missed the Bible class, and shame on you, I'm not going to tell you what happened. But in Acts chapter 8, in verse 1, you'll recall that uh, the church was persecuted and the church scattered. See that? Now in Acts 2, the church, they gathered. When the devil started messing with them, they scattered. Had nothing to do with going to church. They had a lot to do with where the church was going. Hello? Now you got to let me know you're still with me. So, what happened in Acts chapter 2? When the church gathered together, notice this, and it's very important because we've got to be thinking sometimes biblically, what's the church about? Why are we gathered together? What are we doing here as we, as the church, as you've all gathered here today, 
And, and we have to ask, well, what are we doing here? Well, we're here. <laughs> what did we gather for? And so we want to look at that. Acts chapter 4, or rather 2, beginning in number verse, I believe it's verse number 42. Now, the Bible says, first of all, they continued. In other words, this was their practice. Their practice. Their habit. What they were devoted to. What they were doing all the time. They continued in this. And so you'll see that if you're part of the church, you're continuing to do something. Amen? I mean, you're practicing something. This is your way of life. This is what you do. This is what you do regularly. And so you would think, you say, as a member of the church, by the way, member of the church doesn't mean like being a member of the Rotary Club. When you look at Ephesians chapter 4, the idea of being a member of the church is being part of the church. And when he talks about that in 1 Corinthians 12, as you are part of the body, just like your fingers are part of my hand. These hand fingers aren't a member of my hand like the Rotary Club. They are actually a part of my hand. And so if you are a member of the church, it's not because you joined the church. God put you in the church. God added you to the church. And you became a member part of the church. Oh, my. You are actually part of the church. Just like your body, parts of your body are parts of your body. Now I'll say this. I want to do this so I can get out of anybody who's watching. If you're unable to gather because you're unable to gather, I understand that. Paul was in prison a lot and he couldn't assemble with the assembly. Hello? If you are a veteran, you're sick. I was telling Roger just a moment ago. I went across 224 the other last night on Saturday night. Saturday night. And, uh, and we went in the mall. And I said, one of the things I said, the mall, I can't believe how many people are here. And then we went down the road a little bit further. And we went by all the restaurants. They were packed. They were packed. And I mean, there was cars like this everywhere. And I came to the conclusion, you will go where you want to go. That's right. You will be where you want to be. And so if you're unable while you're looking, oh, we're not doing Facebook today. Or oh, we are. Oh. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> if you happen to be listening while you're, you're in your pajamas and you're smoking your cigar, and, uh, you know, you're having a happy time, and you'll watch it later, and uh, after five minutes you'll turn it off and say, yeah, I had it on. That's not worship. It was never to substitute gathering together. As a matter of fact, as you read the book of Hebrews, we'll get there in just a moment. Do you understand that in the book of Hebrews, they're being persecuted, they lost their jobs, they lost their property, and they were still meeting? They may have been meeting in secret, they were in a crisis, there were crises of death, life and death, Ugh. and they were still meeting. And they were still meeting. And they were still meeting. Even if it had been in secret. Now watch Acts chapter 2 again. They were devoted. What does that word mean to you? Helplessly devoted. Yeah. Devoted. Committed. Steadfast. They were continuing. And notice in verse 42. Now this is what the church was doing while they were gathered together. And you've got to ask yourself, are you continuing devoted and committed to doing what the church was doing in the New Testament? <coughs> we talk about restoration all the time. Now, notice here. They continued steadfastly, number one, in the apostles' doctrine. Now, I want to stress this. We've got to understand the importance of teaching. Our job with our young people, with the people who gather together, when we gather together, we ought to be teaching. It's not just to entertain people. You're not going to fund people into the kingdom of God. What you have here is not entertainment, but when they came together. Now, listen for a moment. They were taking this seriously. 
They were people who are not taught. They don't understand the will of God. They're not taught in the doctrine. They're not abiding in the teaching. They're not abiding in the doctrine. Many do not even know the doctrine. And so when the church came together, when they gathered together, the first thing was going on was the instruction of the apostles. And the Bible says we ought to be understanding what the will of the Lord is. We need to be taught. And that's serious. You don't go to school to play, do you? You go to school to be taught. Imagine going to kindergarten, going to first grade, going to second grade, and never being taught the alphabet. I think somebody in 12th grade missed it. I had people in college, when I was in college, one was a basketball player. I don't know if he understood how to read. But he could short put a basketball through the hoop. I was, uh, he came over to my apartment one time, and he had to be about six foot eight. I mean, he was as big as Will Chamberlain. Well, I don't know if he could even spell his name. When you go to school, you go to get educated. You go to get taught. You understand the doctrine. You know, people years ago understood. We need to understand what the Bible teaches. So when they came together, Roger, they came to be taught, to be instructed, to take it seriously. Our young people, as they're coming up through the ranks of the church, need to be taught the Bible. Number two, not only were they taught when they came together, but they came together for fellowship. Now, fellowship, koinonia, means that you are participating, you are supporting, you are together in common doing things to build and support the church. You are an active member of the church. It's not that you come to church and simply listen to a sermon, but you actually become part of it. It's like becoming a part of something you really believe in. If you're a member of some kind of club or some kind of social thing, and you are really into it, and you really believe in that, you're part of it and you're active in it. You know, sometimes I've heard of people that are members of certain churches, and they never even go. Huh. Huh. What kind of member is that? So you see, they came together and the idea of fellowship is that they are participating in whatever they're participating in. And so we need to be, if we're going to be the New Testament church when we gather together, we're not just coming to listen to a sermon and put our time in. We want to be engaged in the body of Christ. Number three. Not only were they doing that, but you see, they were breaking of bread. Now that breaking of bread, Acts 20 and verse number 7, refers to they came together to worship. And the center and the central part of the worship is the Lord's Supper. When they came together, if you were to go to a New Testament church, if you could go back 2,000 years and somehow get into the body of Christ, no matter what body you were into, whether you were in Corinth, whether you were in Ephesus, the thing that you would be seeing them doing every first day of the week is take the Lord's Supper. Remember that He died for you. He gave Himself for you. He loved the church. He purchased the church with His own blood. And so Christ died, and so they would take the Lord's Supper. That would be center. You see it, you see it everywhere. When they came together every Lord's Day, they continued steadfastly in taking the Lord's Supper. And they did it thoughtfully. Now, number four. And when they gathered together, they prayed. I mean, they really prayed. Now, it's important to understand this. When you are praying, you are actually addressing and talking to God. In other words, you can talk to God. The church was praying together. And they were really praying. Now, I want to say this. Uh, and not to get into a lesson on prayer. But I want to say this. America is no longer depending on God to get them out of any kind of mess. Is that true? Now, there was a time, I believe, that the nation would turn to God. 
And it's interesting because I was seeing, watching an image back in World War II. You had all these sailors. I mean, there were thousands and thousands, maybe they were Marines. They were on, the, on a huge ship, aircraft carrier. I don't forget what it was. But when I, they were going into D-Day, and I saw every one of those men, their heads were bowed in prayer because they knew they were going into a battle which meant life and death. And they were praying, every one of them, to the Lord. You see, when we really pray, now I know that when you get sick, you go to a doctor and, and you have to have some confidence in him, but good night, don't go. That makes sense, doesn't it? But have you ever thought that not only should you have confidence in the physician or the surgeon, but you ought to have confidence and trusting in God to get you through it. And not just pray, like it means nothing. But praying to God and saying, God deliver. If you go back to the nation of Israel, oftentimes they were in confrontation and crisis and all kinds of really, really big problems. And you know what they did? They prayed. And they pray. And they pray. Trusting God to get them out. Those four things they did. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, but let's go to Hebrews for a moment, and we'll go we'll go ahead and end this lesson. I am trying to be shorter. I want to be shorter. I know you want me to be shorter. So let's do this. Act real quickly here. I want you to see something in Hebrews here. Now remember, remember, in the book of Hebrews, they're drifting away, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. They're starting to slip from God. That's what I'm afraid of in this whole crisis of the pandemic. We are going to have people that are just going to gradually slip from God. There are going to be people that you know and I know that are likely never to return. They have gotten away from God. And, they, and by the way, here's another research. I'll just throw you right into this for a moment. Not only do they say one third is, only one third has come back, but they're saying now that those that are watching Facebook is in decline, that only about one third again is even watching it. Now, I'll ask Kathy later what our numbers are. But you've got to understand, television, media, radio, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever else is out there, was never meant to take the place of the church gathering together. And here's another thing. I notice that when people are watching Facebook, I don't know, Kathy, what this means, but it says attention goes like this. And that means to me that uh, maybe like today, <laughs> right? Hebrews <laughs> chapter 10, real quick. Beginning in verse number 22. He'll say, let us. He said that three times now. Let us, not let me. Let us. There's an us. Let us, that means we're doing something together, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled uh, from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. Referring to baptism. Now let us again uh, hold fast, hold fast, hold tight, don't let go. The confession of our hope without swerving, leading to the right or the left. Don't let the wind blow you away. Don't let the coronavirus uh, cause you to stumble and never come back. Don't let that happen. No, no, no matter what happens, he says, hold on in spite of the persecution, in spite of the adversity, and how hard it is to get there. By the way, you know we get some people come to church here. There I go, come to church. Let's do it this way. Some of the people of the church come here. And I'll tell you what, when you look at them, you look at Randy, you look at uh, you look at Carol out there, you look at some of these people that have to struggle, have to push themselves to get here. I mean, they got, they're not in the best of shape. I'll tell you what, Carol, if you never came again, I said, I understand. I understand how hard it is for you to come. Well, you get people that are six foot two that can do the race. In the Olympics, and they can't get across the street to come to church. 
I've seen people in my life that stumbled in. I've seen a man walk down the aisle, couldn't walk two steps, couldn't hardly get one foot in front of the other. I remember Boyd Pope was dying of cancer for four years, and he was here every service, every service, every service. And then I see people say they can't come to church, and they're everywhere else. Amazing, isn't it? You want to know why? Because it doesn't mean enough to. They don't understand the church. God is the source of the church. God established the church. It's not a man-made institution. It was in the plan. All right, so, now notice what he says. He says, let us consider. Now, by the way, that word consider is a, is a word that really means that you really look at this. You give it some thought. You think through this. And by the way, it means you are observing with looking to. Well, what are they observing? What are they considering? What are they putting their mind to? Well, what he says is, here, one another. Now, you can't have one another unless you've got one another. <laughs> now, what he says here is, when you come together, don't you forsake the assembly, but when, you, when the church gathers together, what we have to do is consider and be looking at that individual and be thinking about him and what we got to do. By the way, that's a little Greek word, para, that's a prefix, which means you are close next to that person. You can't be close next to that person when you're in Facebook and you're not here. Because we're talking about you are gathering together and as you gather together and you're looking at that person, I'm saying, you know, Roger really messed up this week. And I'm close to him, and I know it, and I need to encourage him. I need to build him up. I need to stir him on. I need to stimulate him, a little sociological word. I need to stimulate him on the love and good works. That's what we're doing. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> we are supposed to do that. Encourage, build up, give them the strength. You can do it. You can hang in there. Don't give up. Stir them up to love and good works. Not forsaking. Not forsaking means this being disconnected. I told Marcy the other day if I skip lunch, I haven't quit eating. If I miss breakfast, I haven't stopped eating. But if I stop eating, I'm going to die. What he's talking about here is a person abandoning, being disconnected from the assembly. Not missing lunch, but he has, com he has completely disconnected himself from the assembly, the church. And the way he is doing that is not assembling with the church. You cannot hang out there on your own. The Bible doesn't know anything about a solitary Christian. It isn't there. It's not there. If you're going to be faithful, you have to be part of the church. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together has the manner of some ears. But exhorting one another as much as you see the day approaching. Now as you read further, we're going to quit right now. But as you read further, I want, to, I want you to think about something. As you read this whole business in the book of Hebrews, it doesn't end well. For many. Because what he'll say is, we are not of those who draw back unto perdition or damnation. That's a bad thing to draw back to. Some are drawing back to that because they have abandoned the assembly. They're just not out there. But in 
abandoned and being disconnected and separated from the assembly, they have forsaken. And the Bible will say, our God is a consuming fire, draw not back to perdition or damnation. I was reading something this week, and uh, I really didn't know much about it, but there was a fellow for the first time since the war between the states, the Civil War, that was executed for preserving the army. It was over in Normandy, and he didn't want to fight. He told the sergeant, "I'm not going to the front line. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going into the battle. Uh, you put me in the rear." And the sergeant said, "I'm not putting you in the rear. You're going out front with the rest of us." He said, "If you do that, I'm going to desert." He did. And six months later, 1945, January the first, they executed the fellow by the name of Slovak for desertion. The only guy since the Civil War that was executed and burnt to death for desertion of Bandai, forsaking, disconnecting. And what the Bible is saying, I want you to understand, I make you make this very clear. You cannot be saved without the church. Christ saves you, and when he saves you, he puts you in the church, you become part of the church, and you are to be faithful to the church. And if you desert, and you go your own way, if you forsake, I'm saying some heavy stuff here. If you forsake, and you abandon, and you go out on your own, it is not a trivial thing. Because you'll be lost. And deserters will not be saved. Now you're not going to hear this in most parent told them pulpits in America. In fact, one fellow told me one time, there's not a church in America that would hire me. Well, that may be so. But I ain't going to get hired anymore. <laughs> but I'm telling you the truth. You need to be faithful to the church. Steadfast. Firm. Persistent. And if there's a Sunday that comes, you'll be here unless you can't be here. And you'll be faithful to God. God died for the church. He loved the church. He gave himself for the church. It was in his plan. And we need to understand more about the church. All right, that's the lesson. Uh, shoot me after I get out of here, all right? Now, so if you're here today, remember, God adds you to the church. It's not by a handshake. God adds those who believe that Jesus died on the cross, that repented of their sins, were immersed in the waters of baptism, then God put them in the church, and they became the church, and there was a church that glorified the Lord. And if you're here today and want to be part of that, let's come together and understand and say. Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting in the cold? He will bear you gently, gently to his fold. See him so and open, open I am whole. Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting? At the door, off he knocked softly, softly o'er and o'er. Hear him, soul, and open, open I implore. Why keep Jesus waiting, knocking at the door? 
After this, we'll have our closing prayer. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, oh but